Ready. Hey. Just in the middle of the field, 45, 50. Green grass in front of him, leaving Lions in his way. I am Jeff Joniak. Blitz is on. <laughs> Down he goes. Oscar. What was it like playing for Coach Dicko? Uh, I don't want to answer any questions like that. 61 yards. A Sunday stroll for Justin Fields. Oh, no way. And Pekara is Pekara is Pekara. Now, Bears Etc. with the voices of the Chicago Bears, Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer. Post-trade deadline, the Bears get stronger on the defensive line. They also keep cornerback Jalen Johnson. How will this impact the Bears moving forward and into Sunday's matchup down in New Orleans against the Saints? Hi, everybody. Jeff Joniak and Super Bowl winning Bears guard Tom Thayer in Episode 30 of the Bears Etc. Podcast. We're brought to you in part today by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. Download the Bet Rivers app today. Coming up, we're going to replay the entire 12-minute news conference from Wednesday with General Manager Ryan Poles. Active day, active storyline, but the biggest is that Montez Swedish, a Chicago Bear, 6'6", and uh, we can talk about the combine all you want. He's four years deep in his league, but when he ran a 440 at uh, 6'6", 270 pounds, caught everybody's attention. Great athlete. He's had a really good year sacking the quarterback in his career. Expects to do the same here. Yeah, but, you know, one thing about the combine, you can see these guys and they go out and they run an impressive 40 or they jump high or they bench a 225 a bunch of times but like you said it's how they put that um talent in motion and i think to me that's been the most impressive thing about montez sweat since he's come aboard into the nfl is that yeah he caught everybody's attention immediately he was on everybody's radar he played had the speed that he plays a very unique position and then can you put all that together because we've seen guys that had special skills that weren't the football players that they had hoped to be, but Montez Sweat has been able to scratch the surface of ultimately where he can go. And the Bears did give up a high second-round pick, uh, as it stands right now anyway. We'll see how the season winds up, but uh, that will be an impact uh, story as well. But the Bears are trying to sign him. Uh, we'll see if he's interested in signing right now. He uh, it would be under Bears' control regardless because they could easily franchise tag him. But Ryan Pohl says they hope to get something done on the on the near term. You'll hear more about that in what Ryan had to say. And, and, and that's what you'd like to do. You give up that kind of draft choice. Capital, Tom, you want to sign him long term. Of course you do. You want a guy come in here that you made a trade midseason of uh, – a portion, an area of the game that you need a lot of help. And he, if he comes in here and performs at a high level, he's a good guy inside the locker room. He can help young guys maybe achieve what ultimately they want to achieve by getting some uh, tutoring on the field. And you work well with the organization, the linebackers, and the team. Yeah, you definitely want to be able to um, have this guy impress you, and then you want to get him signed to a long-term deal. Bears weren't sure he'd be available. Uh, for a minute, he wasn't. Then he was, and other teams were involved, so they took the the swing at it. Uh, we talk about the pass rush all the time, but they got to be edge setters well in the in the run game. And I, you know, going back and watching uh, every snap of that game against Washington, uh, the Bears won, and just some other clips. He, he is a good run defender. Tom, what is your professional opinion of his run defense? You know what? The thing about it, he has length, he has speed, and he has athleticism. Everything that you need to be a good defensive end that plays every portion of the game, first, second, and third down. And I think that's what impressed me most about Montez Sweat is that we all became noticed of him because of the 40 he ran. But I think when you look at his game over the course of years and his development is his willingness to play the run. Because, you know, Jeff, when you look at some of these defensive ends that you become familiar with over your last 30 years in the league, you have guys that want to run on the field on third down and they want to rush the passer. But then you have these guys that are willing to stay on the field in first and second down and be contributors in the running game and that's what I see about Montez and whether he's you know being blocked by a tight end or an offensive tackle he's able to use his traits and his skills and his length equally as effectively against all all pieces. Jalen Johnson remains with the Bears he took the podium on a Wednesday as well gave a very detailed explanation of where he's at your first impulse is well you know he couldn't get a trade done uh, the asking price not quite what the Bears were looking for, and Ryan Poles will talk about that here in a minute. Uh, but he basically asked for a late first, early second, and he was not going to budge from that. But he granted the wish that Jalen's uh, side had said if they, they didn't get a contract done after meeting on Sunday in L.A., 
you know, he asked for a trade, so he said, you know, go go take a look. So they took a look. They're still communicating, though. It doesn't mean they're not going to sign him. Uh, but he is still here. But you wonder, you know, is is he going to have the same desire to be great as a bear without the, the safety net and the security of a long-term contract? We'll hear from Jalen Johnson on that here in a few minutes as well. I was convinced he'll be fine, Tom. He will be fine. So he, he feels he's the best cornerback in the league. He feels he's playing the best ball of his career. And so he continues to uh, make that clear, and now he's got to show it the rest of this season. Yeah, you're right. He's got to show it the rest of the season. And him going up to the podium and saying that he feels that he's one of or not the best cornerback in the league, then you're talking about – what are the teams that are trading for you? What do they think? What is the, what do they think your value is in terms of getting a long term deal done with Jalen if you went and traded for him? And listen, I want every guy to have a high opinion of themselves, but I also want them to go out and prove it. And that's where the kind of where Jalen is right now. If he thinks that he is this type of playmaking cornerback that can really, you know, go out there and play at a blocking down a number one receiver on any team in the league. And if you continue to show it, you're either going to be rewarded here or somewhere else. And he not understands about the franchise tag as well. So um, I hope Jalen comes out here and continues to make the types of plays that cornerbacks need to make in order to be considered one of the tops in the league. Well, when Sweat gets on the field, you presumably uh, will get a bigger impact up front. Guys will get slotted differently. The rotation gets a little more experience and a lot of production. It will help the DB. So that will be an interesting connection with Jalen Johnson. For all your journeys ahead, go with a partner who's been on your team from the beginning, the one members and communities have trusted for over 85 years. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois, always standing by you, with you, for you, through it all. Uh, Also, the news of the day, Tom, the removal of running back coach David Walker dismissed for repeated violations that involved uh, the HR department and workplace conduct. So the new running back coach now will be Omar Young, who's been here uh, under Eberflus, working with wide receivers and also uh, other aspects of the Bears' passing offense. So uh, the running game certainly is something he's uh, been around, and that'll be the, the transition. But, you know, as a second coach in six weeks, better than to just say, yeah, let's just ignore that and move on. you got to make these decisions. They're not easy decisions at this point in the season. What's your thought? Uh, I think it's some of the most difficult decisions you'll ever have to make in an assistant coach's life. Because, Jeff, like I always say, how long you've been around the game and you see how many hours that a lot of these assistant coaches put in to ultimately getting the job that – pays for all the dues that they put in, in life and in time, in the moving that they've had to do throughout their career. And then they finally get the opportunity to get a high profile job in the NFL market. It seems like you'd want to do everything you possibly could to present yourself in the proper way in order to hold on to that job as long as possible. Uh, These guys are paid very handsomely when they do achieve this type of success. And, you know, that's what I think Matt Eberflus has a really high expectation of every one of these guys from character to coaching. Has to. That's the only way it's going to work, uh, for sure. Injury report today. They did not practice on Wednesday, but there was an injury report. Eddie Jackson uh, would be cleared to go the entire day. Brisker, Edmonds, uh, Terrell Smith, Nate Davis all out. Justin Fields out. Limited for Braxton Jones. That 21-day window still open for his return. Uh, from his neck injury. I'd like to see him out there, but I don't want to see a less than 100% Braxton Jones at this point. You? Yeah, not not with the neck issue. And you're you're talking about a position that your neck it comes into play almost every single play. And sometimes it can have an extremely high impact to it if you're pulling or if you're on the move or you're going to the second level. So Braxton Jones is a super young man in his career with a super bright future ahead of him. So coming back from this issue, you got to make sure that you're 100% confident rather than being uncertain about your ability. Busy Hard Seltzer, the official hard seltzer of the Chicago Bears. As I indicated, Ryan Poles met the media on Wednesday. We'll give you the whole thing right here on Bears, etc. We expect him to come here and help our entire team get better. Uh, We see him as a long, fast, explosive, relentless uh, defensive end that can help us both in the run and the pass game. Um, 
and really I see him as a multiplier. He's going to allow uh, everyone to, to play better, our entire defensive front, our corners, our safeties, and again, hopefully the, we talk about the ball all the time, create turnovers and stops uh, so we can be better. In terms of our process, um, really it was a situation where you know you try to forecast forward, uh, you look at the draft potential. Our guys have been doing a really good job getting that information in, uh, as well as for agency. And we felt like this was a really good opportunity to get ahead of that and get a, a top pass rusher in the building. And again, that's short term, but also for long term. Uh, we're currently working on getting a contract done now. <clears throat> to I got a lot of questions about Jalen. Um, First, Jalen and I have a really good relationship, uh, a lot of transparency. We sit down, we talk, we go through different things, um, and heard a lot about not wanting Jalen here long term. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, he knows that we want him here, um, and we've talked about that. Our process there, I'll, I'll just kind of pull back on that whole deal. Anytime we do an extension, I bring players in to sit down and have a conversation to really go over what an extension looks like. What does it feel like? Because the biggest thing is, you can take things personal when you're negotiating um, through an agent. So there's the club side starts one side, the agent starts the other, and you try to find that sweet spot in the middle to get the deal done. And in that in that sense, you can take it personal. And the big thing I want our guys and the guys here to be able to come in my office and talk about if they feel disrespected in any way, and we can talk through it to go because it, it's a tough situation. So I want them to know that my phone's on, my door's open. We talk through that. So we've been able to do that with Jalen and and go through that process. Um, really, with that one, we've exchanged a couple times, and it was one of those situations. A lot of times, it happens when you exchange emails back and forth with deals. Tone can be misunderstood. Emotions can be misunderstood. We all know that. I'm sure we've all texted. And it's like, no, I didn't mean it to be that way. So um, on Sunday, we met with his side. Uh, had really good uh, meetings in L.A. I thought we made progress. Uh, I, talk, I texted my group. I'm like, we'll be able to get this deal done uh, in a matter of days. We come back from the trip, and uh, his team wants to explore uh, a trade situation. So I'm, I'm fine with that, but I brought Jalen in. We sat down. We talked about it. I granted permission to do that. Here's the thing. I'm not, I don't want to lose Jalen Johnson. If I were to lose Jalen Johnson, I would like to have a high percentage of hitting on another Jalen Johnson, which to me is a late first and it's an uh, early second. Um, so really simple there. That didn't happen. So we are still open to getting a contract done. And I'm going to follow Jalen's lead on how he wants to go about doing that. But we're still open. And again, Jalen and I have talked as recently as today. Um, and that's what I got there. So those are two topics. I'll open up for questions. How would you characterize the state of extension talks with Montez and, and, and where you're at with that? Yeah, so he just signed up, um, got the physical done. So it's, you know, we just kicked that off. Um, it's hard to put a timeline on it, but I'm hoping it won't take too long. When it came down to Montez versus Chase Young, we know now that both were on the market. How did you come to the decision to, you know, show us a two for – for Montez versus, you know, uh, Chase Young going for, for a three. Yeah, um, I'll be honest, really didn't think Tez was available for a while. Um, so that door was kind of closed and I, it was going to be kind of quiet and then it popped back up um, in the last couple hours. Brian, Brian, we talked to Matt earlier today. You, you had your second assistant coach leave in six weeks. Yep. Does he have a culture problem? Do the Bears have a culture problem? And if no, why, why not? Because these things don't happen, and now it's happening twice in six weeks. Yeah, well, I can be really clear with that one. We have uh, expectations here, and this comes from me, Kevin, George, and Matt. If you don't meet those expectations of how you move around this building, how you treat people, how you talk to people, how you act, you don't belong here. So the alternative is you do nothing, and you just kind of brush it on the rug and you're cool with that, which we're not, or you, you act accordingly to make sure that your culture is strong. So unfortunately, just I feel like every time I talk, it's like the easy way, the quiet way, the hard way is the loud way, and we have to deal with this, but that's how we're going to do business here. So, Right. How, how certain are you that you can get a deal done with Sweat without using the franchise tax? Because when you spend a second, obviously it's a long-term thing. Does that put you in a little bit of a tough situation leverage wise uh, trying to get uh, knowing that you need to have this guy here long term yeah I feel really confident that we can get a, a deal done right
Brian, what is the benefit of being able to negotiate with him now, um, essentially paying a second round pick to do that as opposed to waiting till March and getting involved in, in that situation? Yeah, I think it's capitalizing right now because you start to lose um, opportunities. Um, it's really hard to see, you know, it's like we talked about, like if you look at the free agent stack now, um, it's going to look very different by the time you get to, to that point of the year um, because there's so many different opportunities that can pop up in terms of extensions, tags, different things like that. So uh, we decided with that type of player, we want to capitalize on that now. And you got a sense that if you guys weren't the ones to trade from yesterday, somebody else would have. Yes. Are you surprised at the pass rush up until this point, given how many draft resources, free agent resources that you've utilized that it hasn't panned out the way that you might have been hopeful for? Yeah, you're always hopeful with the guys that you're bringing in. Um, but sometimes you just need, you know, someone uh, that can come in and, and create some disruption where now you have to slide the offensive line a certain way. You have to double team certain people. And then that starts, again, we're talking about multipliers where it can open up different situations for different guys to get home. So I'm hoping that this improves that. We're aggressive again this year. Same situation, second round pick. What gives you confidence that this time, this move of the trade deadline is going to work out? Yeah, it's one of those things. That, again, I try to take a lot of pride in it. But, you know, you look at things that you do, if they fail or you make mistakes, can you look back at why and address those? And then I think the key is, like, sometimes you become a little bit shy to make aggressive moves as you move forward. Um, but that's just not how we're wired. So it took a lot of those things from, from that situation and kind of went through that process and said, okay, here's, here's where we may have messed up this. And then for this one, not to, not making the same mistake and, and learn from that. Right. It was obviously a significant move on your part to open the door for Jalen and his camp to go seek a trade yesterday. What was in that for you? Philosophic, philosophically, what, what were you? Can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. Water. Obviously, it was a significant measure by you to open the doors for Jalen and his camp to, to explore trade possibilities yeah. yesterday. From, from your vantage point, philosophically, what was advantageous to you to allowing them to, to do that? Because obviously, you didn't have to grant that if you didn't want um, I think, again, it's the respect that I have for Jalen, too. It's like, uh, if, if that's in your heart that you want to go check that out, go check that out and see what comes back. If, if everything lines up perfectly, well, if you want to go somewhere else, then that can happen. If that brought the pick where I felt like we could get another Jalen Johnson, then we can do that, too. So it's really just to have clarity on the situation, but it had to work out perfectly for both sides to Why get it done. Why such a, a financial divide between what he is looking for and what you're willing to do? That's the thing. We we never got to that point. That's why we met in L.A. in terms of let's close the gap and figure out where to go next. Because when you negotiate, you, just like anything else that you guys have done, it's you go back and forth a couple steps. So there was only a few steps. No one was final. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I guess obviously there's still... I don't know what the gap is. Okay. Is, does that frustrate you, not having a, a clarity, I guess? On, on... It was a surprise because we were working to close the gap. So there had not been an offer extended? Is that is that? Well, there were offers, but there was no last and final from any side. Ryan, between the losses and the staff issues, why are you confident still that Matt is the right coach for this team? Yeah, and I get the question. He... What I see on a, every every day where I see him address the team and I see his approach through adversity, it is stable, man. And I know in the outside world it doesn't look like that, and I know it looks like we're far away, but this dude comes in every day and just keeps chipping away. He has high integrity. The people that he brings in here, he's done the work to make sure that they're the people they're supposed to be. Again, we hold that standard if it doesn't follow that and, and and people aren't acting that way they're not here but the way that he holds holds everything down here is incredible for how loud it is how tough it is i mean this team you could watch them they fight i know this past weekend wasn't great but you can't watch that team and be like oh they're gonna fold most teams fold and they're not folding it's been hard it's been really hard especially from where we started last year trying to build this and do it the right way what I see from him on a daily basis and how he gets his team ready on a weekly basis, to me, I see a grown man that has leadership skills to get this thing out of the hole and into where it needs to be. Right. You, you said before the season that this team can be measured on winning. Why hasn't this team lived up to that standard? Yeah. Uh, we got to execute better. We got to execute better. Um, 
we got to continue to put guys in the right positions. We got to continue to add good players to help us get over the hump. We got to add playmakers to, like, when you have some of these mistakes that we've had, when you watch just NFL football in general, you have guys that can just, I call them erasers, erase some of those mistakes, those turnovers, make plays. And we just got to get to a place that we can do that and also close the gap where we can play clean football. When we've played clean football this year, we've won games. When it gets sloppy, we haven't. So we just got to continue to clean it up and, and fix that sh execution. Right, just, right. to, just to clarify the Jalen situation, I was a little confused. His camp has a number. The Bears have a number. Why is there no middle? That's how it works. How does it work? How, how has it? You go back and forth. Right. And you try to find the sweet spot. So you have to conclude that and say, hey, this is my final. This is your final. And then you know what the gap is. But we haven't gotten there yet. Is this some kind of one? some kind of maybe endorsement of what you, your quarterback situation? You're you're taking the control out of your hands somewhat. You're adding to your defense. You're improving your roster in your eyes. Does this maybe say you're kind of comfortable with how your quarterback situation lies? Um, I would say in general, our philosophy is just continue to add really good football players to this roster so that we can win football games. So he hit some of the things uh, we discussed. Tom, anything else stick out about Ryan Poles' news conference on Wednesday that uh, resonates with you? I, I know they asked him about Coach Eberflus and why he still believes in him, and he, he gave a real passionate answer for that and the grind and, and the old process of dealing with adversity, which they've faced a ton here out of the gate, beginning with that opening loss to the Packers in week one, where they're at right now, two and two in the last four, yes, uh, new additions, subtractions because of injury, coaching changes, uh, you name it, it's happened. Uh, they've had some tough losses, some blowout wins. I mean, it's only week <laughs> week nine, but a lot has gone on. Yeah, you know, I think you always have to consider when Ryan talks about what this roster looked like and what the building looked like when he came aboard and how much change there has been since then. And you do see the signs of development, even though Matt Eberflus had to take over mid-stride to become the defensive coordinator. And the defense has ma has been making improvements. And hopefully a guy like Montez Sweat that uh, Ryan Poles obviously went out and studied and had a, an attraction to in terms of what he could do for this football team can make the defensive backs better. If you got the interior of the line, who I think is improving significantly along with the rookies, they can help the outside rushers like the outside rushers can help the interior guys. But I think when you think of Ryan Poles, it's it's hard not to think about where this building is right now with Ryan Poles, with Kevin Warren, and with Matt Eberflus. I think they have a positive working relationship that you would like to see take major strides through the remainder of the season. All right, let's listen to a little Montez Sweat. His arrival at Chicago, first uh, first stop was the podium and answering <laughs> right, questions. Right. So a guy doesn't even know where he's going to live for the time being. And that's the part of it. You know, there is a other side of it. Anybody who has a job and they get transferred and you got to start right away, but in a high-pressured business of football with all eyes are on you, they expect him to be on the field Sunday afternoon down in New Orleans and to play football and to play winning football. But you got to get your life set up very quickly, find out where you're going to live and all that. You moved once in your career, and uh, but you were a single guy. Uh, you had no, no attachments other than your family and, and Joliet, but you weren't living with them. Uh, and you can get by with board shorts and flip-flops and do your <laughs> thing in Miami. And, you you know, you just picked up some friends and let's go. Let's, let's go play football. You know, that's what I did, Jeff. I went down there and I had my equipment and I had an overnight bag filled with shorts and flip-flops and T-shirts. And uh, luckily enough, I had a friend down there that had a pl offered me a place to live and uh, – um, a minivan, and, uh, <laughs> and that's what that's how I survived over the next eleven weeks, and I enjoyed it. But a, I, again, I was I was on my own and only accountable for myself. When he talked about wardrobe and living and getting the car <laughs> right, up here right. and all that kind of stuff, and then you you think, well, so what happens if he does sign a long term contract midway through the end of the season? And now you're talking about bringing your whole life up here, not just for a, a period of time. Right. All right. Here's uh, Montez Sweat. I'm just going. Uh, I know I'm doing media right now. Afterwards, I'm, I mean, I ain't even been to my locker yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> been through that, right, Montez. Do you, do you expect to play Sunday? Do you, will you be able to, to get out there right away? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Oh, I, don't I don't know that yet either. If, if the, the, if the Justin Fields you guys faced him. 
rumors was was swirling about news about the trade. Man, I was actually uh at <laughs> at, at walkthrough and uh I don't know. Well, I was on my way. I was on my way to walkthrough and uh the rumors was was squirreling about. So I had my phone close to me. My agent gave me a call. And there it was. What are your emotions like when you get that call? I mean, it was a lot. It was a lot of it was a lot of emotions. I mean, I was in Washington for maybe what four or five years. I developed some strong relationships there that I mean would, would last after that. And I mean, you gotta pick up shop and find a new home. So it's it's a lot of emotions that come with that. But I mean, I'm 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 ready for the challenge. I'm ready to meet my new team. Like said, hit the ground roll. We also talked about Jalen Johnson, Tom, and uh, I, I just want to run one clip and just how he feels about himself as we alluded to at the top of the show here he feels he's the best for one i played my best year that i played at the bears for one um two i feel like my impact is is greater than it has been um and i mean i feel like they're arguably i feel like i'm i'm the best corner in the game right now so i mean just going off that and continue to play at a high level that's not that's not going to change and i feel like for for me, that only increases my value, and it just happens that you strike the iron while it's hot. And, of course, uh, now continue to show it. Uh, the New Orleans Saints, uh, this is what this uh, podcast is about, but so much happened here in the in the last couple days that we had to shift gears. But the focus now becomes the New Orleans Saints for the rest of the week, and Jalen Johnson will be facing some really good receivers and a quarterback in Derek Carr that he's uh, known for a while and has faced before. Uh, but that team is uh, an interesting one. I can't figure them out yet. The defense is very good. They're going to be better playing in the Dome. Uh, you know, once upon a time when the Saints were great, they were the Dome Patrol, right? They were sacking yeah. quarterbacks and playing vicious football. And they have those type of players, edge rushers, a, a secondary that I value, a, a linebacker in Demario Davis has done a great job and has been a, a longtime vet there. But on the opposite side of the ball, they, they have run out 32 offensive players, Tom, the most in the league so far in the first eight weeks of the season, and they have played a full. They haven't had their bye yet. So they've played eight games. 32 offensive players have already run through. They run a lot of different personnel groups, and they're not going to be easy to maintain uh, in terms of their, their excellence. They have outstanding receivers. Michael Thomas, as we know, had uh, the injury woes the past couple of years, but the last time the Bears played him, he was considered arguably the top receiver in football or at least one of the top three. Uh, and Chris Olave and the speed of Shahid, there is a lot to deal with, and Alvin Kamara included. Yeah, and, the, you know, don't bring up Taysom Hill because you have yeah. a guy that is such a jack-of-all-trades that you really don't know what they're going to do when he's in the game. He can play quarterback, he can play tight end, he can play fullback, he can play wide receiver. And then you mentioned all those other players that they got world-class speed. They have one of the top receivers that's been in the game, although he's been injured the last couple years. They have a running back that is top he tops in the game so you know I think even uh, Tyson Bajan said it at the podium that they have to play perfect football on offense because the defense moves so perfectly together they have an older group of guys that have been around in this system for a while and I think when you look at the offensive side of the ball they can do a lot of different things so listening to Jalen Johnson at the podium today the first thing I would do is go and introduce myself to Montez Sweat and tell him how important it is to have him on the field today yeah no question uh you know also Bajan talked about as you alluded to the defense has been together a while. Dennis Allen's yep. the head coach, and he is aggressive. He he can be really aggressive as a, as a play caller. So it'll be interesting to see how these guys are deployed. Uh, but I've been impressed with watching right defensive end Carl Granderson, Tom. He's an outstanding pass rusher, undrafted free agent. Back in 2017, he got himself a big contract as an undrafted player, and he's probably been their most impactful defensive player, taking nothing away from Cam Jordan, but he's on the other side of 30. He's been there a while. Slowing down just a smidge, not the same exact player, but still very productive. And then, as I mentioned, the middle linebacker and the green dot linebacker, Demario Davis. And then you got Marshawn Lattimore. Paulson Adebo is another corner. He shined last week. Marcus May is under the weather a little bit at safety. And Tyron Matthew is there. Uh, so <laughs> Honey uh, Badger. Yeah, the Honey Badger has been around a while, uh, but he's still he's still on the scene. So, there's a lot on defense the Bears are going to have to, to root out. What is your biggest concern about facing that defense with Tyson Bajan right now? Crowd noise. 
Uh, and it's hard to hide. I've been in that stadium as an offensive lineman where you can't hear the calls being made, it, whether the center is directly under, under or whether the quarterback is directly under center or you have to make adjustments at the line of scrimmage. When the line ba- or when the offensive lineman or the quarterback is pointing out the the linebacker of responsibility, you almost have to look and see who he's pointing out because you can't hear him call him out. But when you think of the big picture of the game, there's going to be three free agents that are going to have a huge part of the outcome of this game. When you look at Rashid, you look at Granderson, and you look at Tyson Bajan. Yeah. Now you're going to have three free agents that didn't get drafted, but they can do enormous things. And so to me, every time I played in New Orleans, um, it's always been crowd noise is my biggest concern. However, I will tell you this, if the Bears <laughs> go in there and they run the ball well, they run it efficiently, they run it at four yards a pop, they have 35 carries of effective football, they can drown the crowd out of the game. So I think if there's any one key to this game, it's running the ball effectively to bore the crowd out of it. Hey, and I do tempo too. That takes a crowd out of it when you're, getting, when you're gashing teams. So hopefully that can happen as well. Uh, I think he'd be good. I mean, they they dabbled in it last week, uh, but obviously they're working from behind. We're brought to you by PNC, official bank of the Bears, and Miller Lite, the official beer of the Chicago Bears. Tastes like Miller time, Chicago. Tom can't go past this day without uh, remembering Walter Payton once again, uh, your teammate, your friend, a powerful man. Uh, 24 years ago on November 1st, passed away. The next day, I have a daughter, Caitlin, who's uh, you're like uh, – uh, an uncle to her and, and my other daughter, Kelly, so I never forget this day. And I saw a Jim Brown quote from NFL Films earlier today. He said, give me the heart of Walter Payton because no one had a bigger one. A guy who doesn't run out of bounds to avoid contact is my kind of guy. And certainly he played with the attitude and the ability uh, that Jim Brown played with. And it was uh, Jim Brown whose record was broken by Walter Payton and the rushing record. But uh, a big a big hole in the Chicago Bears family without Walter here. Yeah, it is. It, it is and it always will be um, because Walter Payton is fondly remembered by every single person that's ever had a chance to meet him. And he's so fondly remembered by every person that's ever got to watch him dedicate himself to football. He did incredible things on the field. Um, he was just so talented and self-motivated. <clears throat> he was not a guy that had to go out and hire a personal trainer because he trained himself harder than anybody else could train him. Um, he was a model citizen in the locker room on and off the field. He made people feel comfortable every time he came across them. Um, and Walter was, you know, special beyond compare. And you see a reflection of it when we're fortunate to see uh, Jared and his daughter, Brittany, and his wife, Connie, for that matter, but how great of people they are because, you know, they were all super influenced by, by Walter, the father. And so when you want to talk about every walk of life and being a great person that's fondly remembered, it's Walter Payton. Yep. Great family. Great, great, great family. Hey, after you guys' uh, careers were over, did you guys just ever pick up the phone and give each other a call or, or uh, get out together at all? Of tons of times. I was super fortunate to be friends, and my mom had a great friendship with Walter. And I always talk about this photo album that I have here because there was about four or five times that Walter showed up at my house down here in Joliet. Um, and, um, he just showed up on his own because he knew that my family got together every Sunday in one time, Walter came and drove to a McDonald's and went up to the counter and said, Hey, I know Ann Thayer works here. Can you tell me where she lives? And they go, Oh my God, it's Walter Payton. So they brought him to the phone. They called my mom on the phone. He got directions how to get here and, and showed up and it's, it's almost like a scene out of uh, the Rocky movie because Walter would sit in the backyard. Uh-huh. He would be here on his motorcycle and all the neighborhood kids would come over here and he would hold a couple at a time. They would sit on his motorcycle. They would put on his helmet. 
And um, I was super, super fortunate to have a friendship with him that extended well beyond our playing years. Wow, that is an awesome story. Awesome, awesome. Well, when I covered the Bulls, he was always showing up. You know, he kind of zipped downtown faster than uh, most people would get there. He found a <laughs> right. way, but he was always sitting there rooting MJ and the boys on. So it was always good to, to say hello to him. Certainly uh, a treasure uh, that we all miss, that's for sure. All right, Tom, that's going to uh, wrap up our show for this week. Uh, good news, Chicago. United Airlines getting brand new planes with all the bells and whistles, like Bluetooth connectivity, screens at every seat and room for everyone's roller bag. United, proud to fly the Chicago Bears and you too. For Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Joniak. Thanks for listening, everybody. Our next Bears Etc. podcast drops next Tuesday after the trip to New Orleans. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe now on the Chicago Bears official app, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Bear down, everybody.